Welcome to the exam review of the UK Actuarial Profession CT6 exam paper for April 2013. I'm John Lee, a tutor from ACTED, the actuarial education company, which provides tuition on behalf of the actuarial profession. In this video, we'll give a brief overview of each of the questions on this paper. For more detailed solutions, please refer to our asset, ACTED's Solutions and Exam Technique, which give both model and alternative solutions, as well as a thorough explanation of all the steps. This will be available from August 2013 from our ReStore in time for students' preparation for the September 2013 exams. Well, the paper kicked off with a simulation question from Chapter 14 of the Notes. This was a dreamy four marks, and all it required was that you took your random numbers, which we'll denote by U, and equate them to the CDF or the Vable distribution. All that's required is that you rearrange this to obtain the value of X. This would have presented absolutely no problems whatsoever to any well-prepared candidate. So that's four marks in the bag. Question 2 involves the method of percentiles from Chapter 3 of the Notes. Here we are told that claims follow an exponential distribution and the upper quartile claim size is 240. So we would expect three quarters of the distribution to be below the value 240, i.e. the CDF of 240 is equal to three quarters. A little rearranging will obtain your exponential lambda, and then you can calculate your mean claim size from there. Again, this should have been an easy four marks. Question three requires us to calculate the posterior probability that an actuary gets up late, given that they arrive more than 20 minutes late to work. Whilst it says posterior probability, you're going to have to work this out from first principles using Bayes' theorem, which is given on page five of the tables. So we require the probability they got up late, given that they're more than 20 minutes late. Using Bayes' theorem, this is equal to the probability they're more than 20 minutes late, given that they got up late, times by the probability that they got up late. And this is all divided by the probability that he was more than 20 minutes late, which can be split up into the same probability is more than 20 minutes late, given that he got up late, times the probability is late, plus the probability was more than 20 minutes late, given that he got up on time, times the probability got up on time. This is now the third time since April 2010 that examiners have required a first principles approach to obtaining the posterior distribution. This is clearly an examiner's favourite, and so why students should take note of this. Question 4. Test decision theory from chapter 1 of the notes, and is the first time that a two-player zero-sum game has been asked in the exam. Part 1 is an easy two marks to explain what a two-player zero-sum game is, whereas part 2 deals with calculating the strategy. Your first step will be to write down the payoff matrix. Note that in the question, we're asked for Sally's expected payoff, and so it would make sense to write the payoff table for Sally, which would have looked something like this. Now, rather than going for a straightforward strategy using the minimax criterion, we are instead going to be applying a randomised strategy. So we assign the probability P and 1 minus P to each of Sally's choices and work out the expected payoff to Sally if Fiona chooses 10 and the expected payoff to Sally if Fiona chooses 40. Since we're asked to determine the value of P where the payoff is the same, we simply equate these two payoff equations. Part B asks you to explain why this strategy is optimal and there are a variety of sensible answers you could give here whereas part C is to actually calculate the expected payout, which simply requires you take your value of P from part A and substitute it into either of the expected payoff equations. Whilst none of these steps were complicated, given that this was the first time it's come on the exam, it may be the case that some students neglected to study this part of chapter one and could have been caught short. Question five, test runoff triangles from chapter 11 of the notes. And yet again, we are asked to calculate the outstanding claims using the basic chain ladder. Surprisingly, the basic chain ladder has been asked four times in the last six papers. And this would have been an absolute gift of seven marks to any students who's actually bothered to read the notes. The only twist is that we're given incremental claims rather than cumulative claims. And so your very first step would be to accumulate those figures before calculating your development factors. Question six tests the collective risk model which is covered in chapter seven of the notes. Claims follow a Poisson process with parameter lambda and individual claim amounts are X, whose distribution we're not told. 
we were asked to derive the third central moment of s and show that the coefficient of skewness is the formula given. So the first port of call would have been to turn to page 16 of the tables and use the formula there. Now it does actually give the third central moment for a compound Poisson as lambda times m3. But given that the question asks us to derive this, somehow we need to do a little bit more work. The approach would have been to use the given formula for the MGF of S. Once we've got this, we can then obtain the CGF by logging the MGF. You may then recall that we can obtain the third central moment, or the skewness of S, by differentiating the CGF three times and substituting in T0. This will give us lambda M3 as required for the numerator. And recall to obtain the coefficient of skewness, we need to divide the skewness by the variance to the 3 over 2. How do we obtain the variance? Well, we simply differentiate the CGF twice and substitute in T is 0. This should have been fairly straightforward, though surprisingly some students were a little bewildered at what to do. Part 2 is a little bit more exciting. We have to show that S is positively skewed regardless of the distribution of X. Well, all we have to do is show that both the numerator and the denominator of that formula are positive. Well, we know that a Poisson process must have a positive lambda, so we simply have to show that m2 and m3 are always positive. m2 is equal to e of x squared, and if you square the values, then it's definitely going to be positive. m3 is equal to e of x cubed, and we can only be certain that this is positive if x is positive. Well, there's nothing in the question to suggest that, other than the fact we're told that it's claim amounts. And claim amounts necessarily must be positive, although it would be lovely for insurance companies if claims were negative. The final part of this question simply looks at the limiting value of this formula as lambda approaches infinity. Note that even if you weren't able to derive the formula in part 1, you could have simply used it in parts 2 and 3 to get the rest of the marks in the question. Question 7 tests generalised linear models from chapter 10 of the notes. And once again, we're asked to show that a distribution is a member of the exponential family. And in this case, we're asked to show that the gamma distribution is a member of the exponential family, which is exactly what they asked in September 2010 question 6 and April 2007 question 10. It's clearly a hot favourite. Given that there are only five distributions that were required to show our members of the exponential family, why students will have practised all these five, and so this would have been an easy five marks. However, note that the question specifically asks us to give the natural parameter, or theta, and the canonical link function, which is actually listed on page 27 of the tables. In part two of the question, we have to choose between different models by considering the scale deviance. The method behind this is a large drop in scale deviance implies that the model is a significant improvement, whereas a small drop implies that it's not. There's two ways we can do this. We see if the change in scale deviances is more than the 5% critical value from a chi-squared distribution, where the degrees of freedom is the difference in parameters for each of the models. Or we could use the approximate formula, where the change in scale deviance is more than twice the change in the number of parameters. However, annoyingly in this question, we are not given the number of parameters. And to work this out, you need to obtain the formula for each of the predictors. One of the most common mistakes will be to think that age is a variable. However, it very clearly says that the age is a categorical parameter with three categories, i.e. it is a factor. Once you've got the parameters, this question will be no problem at all. However, I suspect many students will have messed this up. We'll go through how to calculate parameters in detail in the asset. However, given that there's a huge difference between model A and model B, a huge difference between model B and model C, and a tiny difference between model C and model D, it shouldn't have been too hard to guess that it is model C which is the best choice. Question 8 involves claims on a portfolio of insurance policies. Claims arise according to a Poisson process with rate mu, but the mu follows a gamma distribution. And we're asked to obtain the average and the variance in the number of annual claims per policy. This question is actually extremely similar to April 2002 question 7. So using n to denote the number of claims, we have that n given mu is a Poisson mu, where mu has a gamma distribution with parameters 2 and 8. So we have the conditional distribution of n, but we want to obtain the average of just the number of claims, i.e. e of n, the unconditional moment. And to do that, 
we'll simply use the formula from page 16 of the tables, that e of n is equal to the expectation of the expectation of n given mu. Similarly, to obtain the variance, we'll use the second formula given on page 16, that the variance of n is equal to the expectation of the conditional variance plus the variance of the conditional expectation. Alternatively, you could have approached this question using mixture distributions. However, typically we would recommend this only after a stiff drink. In part two, we now need to calculate the mean and variance of the annual aggregate claims for the whole portfolio. And to do that, we'll use the collective risk formula also given on page 16. That is E of S is equal to E of N times E of X, and the variance of S is equal to E of N times variance of X, plus E squared X times variance of N. However, don't get caught out. This will give us the mean and variance of the annual claims for one policy, but we're told there is 1,000 policies in this portfolio. Given that it's reasonable to assume that these are independent, we'll simply multiply the mean and variance by 1,000. The second part of the question involves calculating the probability of aggregate claims exceeding a retention of 0.55 million. Well, given that we're just using a normal approximation with the mean and variance we worked out in part two, this would have presented no problem. Part four asks us to comment on the fact that in the last three years, the total claim amount has exceeded the retention. And presumably we're gonna be chatting about how unlikely this is, which suggests that something is wrong in our model or in our normal approximation. Question nine tests ruin theory from chapter nine of the notes. This question is extremely similar, some would say nigh on identical, to April 98 question 14. However, given that this paper is not available from the profession's website, you would have only met it had you gone to a revision day with us. In part one, we have to explain how the parameters affect the probability of ultimate ruin. Notice how the question asks us to explain. Simply say it increases, decreases, or doesn't affect the probability of ultimate ruin would have only got you half the marks. In part two of the question, we need to find the adjustment coefficients for three models, one with fixed claims, one with an exponential distribution, and one with the gamma distribution. Those of you who attended tutorials will be aware that these are the three standard distributions for which we're required to find the adjustment coefficient. However, notice the subtlety. We're asked to find the numerical value of RB only, and then to show that RB is less than both RA and RC. That's implying that the exponential is easy to solve, but the other two aren't. Given that it's a show that question, no formal proof or solving is required. We simply have to substitute in some numbers to demonstrate that this is true. Part three of the question is a clever little trick, which I suspect most students would have missed. The MGF for the gamma distribution was given by one minus four RC to the power of minus 50. We're gonna to have to do a little bit of clever rearranging to use the one plus x over n result. Writing it as one over one minus four RC to the 50 helps a little, which tells us that n is 50. And so with the little rewriting, we can see that this will be approximately equal to e to the minus 200 RC, which was the MGF for fixed claims of 200. But I rather suspect that most students will have looked at this, not had a clue where to start, and simply shoved on. And given that it was only two marks, this was probably a wise choice. Question 10 tests both maximum likelihood estimation from chapter three of the notes and EBCT model one from chapter six of the notes. We're told that claims have a Poisson distribution, but the different types have different parameters. We're given some data and have to obtain the maximum likelihood estimate for lambda. So we'd have to obtain the likelihood of lambda, which will be the probability of obtaining the given claims of type one, which has a Poisson lambda, times by the probability of obtaining each of those claims for a type two, which has a Poisson two lambda, times by the probability of obtaining each of those claims for type three, which has a Poisson five lambda. Part two of the question involves EBCT model one. Given that all the formulae are given on page 29 of the tables, this should have been a very easy seven marks. The only thing you need to remember is that you estimate the premiums or average number of claims by multiplying the credibility factor Z by the mean claims for each type, plus one minus Z times the overall claims. We then need to comment on the results and it can be a little tricky to see what's going on here. So start with the obvious things, are these results similar or not? And then from there, what does that tell you? Part four asks us to explain the main weakness of using EBCT model one. And hopefully this would have been easy bookwork marks 
to simply quote that it doesn't consider the volume, in this case, the number of buildings covered. Our final question tests time series. However, the first part of this was a little bit unusual and may have thrown students. We're given an autoregressive model of order 1 and told that the white noise is normally disputed with mean 0 and variance sigma squared, and we start with value 0. However, we're then asked to show that the conditional distribution of xt given xt minus 1 is normal, and then obtain the likelihood. Well, this isn't as hard as it looks. The distribution of xt given xt minus 1 is equal to some particular value, little xt minus 1, is obviously going to be equal to alpha times little xt minus 1 plus et. What distribution will this have? Well, since we fixed our xt minus 1, that's just a constant. So we'll have a distribution of a constant plus the white noise term which is normally distributed. So it's distributed as the constant alpha xt minus 1 plus a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance sigma squared, i.e. is normally distributed with mean alpha xt minus 1 and variance sigma squared. Students who would have looked at the x4 assignment would have seen there is a question fairly similar to this. We now have to obtain the likelihood of obtaining these observations, and so we'll need to multiply the PDFs of this conditional distribution. That is the PDF of x1 given x0 times by the PDF of x2 given x1, all the way up to the PDF of xn given xn minus 1. In part 2, we have to show that the maximum likelihood estimate of alpha can be regarded as a least squares estimate. Recall that the least squares estimate is the one that minimizes the sum of the squares of the error terms. Using our formula, we can see this is equivalent to minimizing the sum of xi minus alpha xi minus 1 squared. We can see this in our numerator. Shouldn't be too hard to now show this equivalence. Part 3 asks us to actually calculate the maximum likelihood estimates. So even if you hadn't been able to obtain the likelihood, you could simply take that, log it, and differentiate with respect to alpha, set it equal to 0, and differentiate it with respect to sigma and set it equal to 0. This should have been fairly straightforward. Part 4 of the question asks us to derive the Yule-Walker equations, and students who were hoping for a big time series question would have breathed a sigh of relief at this moment. We're then asked to derive the estimates of alpha and sigma squared based on observed values of the autocovariance function. Simply put, we'll need to obtain the Yule-Walker equations for gamma 0 and for gamma 1 in terms of our alpha and sigma squared, and then we use our observed values of these autocovariance functions, i.e. gamma 0 hat and gamma 1 hat, and rearrange those to obtain formulae for alpha and sigma squared. The final one mark is to comment on the difference in the estimates. But I guess if you were like most students, your brain would have fried by this point, and you wouldn't have been able to think of anything to write. Good job it's only one mark. If you'd like to chat with your fellow students about this paper, then feel free to post on our forums at www.acted.co.uk forward slash forums.